السلام علیکم خواتین حضرات آئی ویلکم یو ٹو دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان اے کورس از برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور اینڈ وی آر ان ٹو لیکچر نمبر تھرٹین ان دا لاسٹ لیکچر نمبر ٹویلو آئی ٹاک اباؤٹ دا کانسیپٹ آف برانڈ کانٹریکٹ وچ مینس دیٹ وی آر پاسنگ تھرو دی سیکنڈ اسٹیپ آف دی سیکنڈ فیز آف دی اسٹریٹجک برانڈ مینجمنٹ پروسیس If you take a look at the screen, you will see that there are three steps in this phase, starting with creating your brand image, about which we are very clear by now. The second step we are still talking about is developing your brand contract. And the third one is, which I shall be talking in the next lecture perhaps, creating a customer-based brand model. So we are still passing through the second step. And uh, in the hope that our understanding of the brand contract's definition is very clear, because all the points that I discussed in the previous lecture converged upon a very explicit definition which talks about a brand contract being a set of promises that have to be fulfilled. And these promises, or a set of uh, these promises, is created internally, meaning within the company. having everyone together, coming up with all the attributes and features, making sure that they become deliverable, and then seeing to it that that set of promises created by the company internally is validated by the consumers in the market. Consumers will endorse the brand contract which they have gotten into. which I will repeat is an economic contract. It's not a legal contract. And it has ethical overtones from the company's point of view and emotional overtones from the consumer's or the customer's point of view. What it boils down to is that this contract is to be upheld so that consumers do not lose the levels of associations that they have developed toward your brand. So any promises that the company cannot deliver must not be a part of the contract. A company can get into two different kinds of situations. One is that the company knows that one particular promise is not deliverable and yet in an implicit manner or at times also in explicit manner, the company does talk about that promise and the promise doesn't get delivered. bringing the brand a bad name, meaning lost sales, tarnished image, so on and so forth. What the consequences could be, your guess is as good as mine. The second situation a company might find itself in is that it knows very well that a certain promise cannot be delivered, meaning that a certain benefit is not part of the product's attributes. It doesn't stem from the basic features. So why talk about that? Such companies are very realistic and prudent companies, and they do not talk about those negative prom promises. To have a clear understanding of promises, we must know that there are promises which are implicit, and there are promises that are explicit. What are implicit promises? I hope you do understand what is meant by implicit. Implicit means that something is present in the product and yet it is not visible. So in other words, when a company chooses not to talk about the implicit promises, it takes it for granted that these promises are very much deliverable and our consumers are so loyal to the product that they know that these promises are being delivered day in, day out. I'll give you an example of a product. Tea. The aroma, the smell which you get, you take it for granted that it has to be good. The color, it is again one of those implicit things. I mean, it goes without saying in the communications that the color should be good. Now, these implicit promises also are relative. If we are talking of a brand, 
which is very well established and which has a very loyal following and it is at the pinnacle of the value pyramid, then of course these promises are very implicit, like I have explained. Let's talk about a company or a new entrant which is trying to enter the market or which has just entered the market. And this brand would like to make its presence known. And this brand doesn't want to leave anything to customers or consumers' imagination. The brand may start talking in very explicit terms about the benefits or about the promises it carries and it is sure about delivering. It may start talking about the same things which for, for brand A are very implicit, for brand B may become explicit because brand B thinks, I would not like to leave anything to customers' imagination and therefore I would like them to know that I also carry a beautiful color and a beautiful smell and also good taste. So this brand is being very explicit in terms of its communication of the promises it carries. Another example, which is an extension of the same concept which I'm talking about is the taste. Now taste is something which could be a function of so many different variables. The aroma, the color that we've talked about and uh, other variables that come into play could be the source, meaning where tea is planted, I mean the source country. And then you see the blending which has taken place at the end of um, uh, packaging or, or processing, whatever you may call it. Therefore, brand B may also need the feel to talk about the taste as well. And it is because of that reason that uh, you hear companies dealing in these kind of products talking about the source country fresh from the fields of such and such country. Just to give you one example. Another example could be any technological development taking place in a category which is technology intensive. For example, VTI engine. Another one comes into the market with a laddered up engine and they start talking about VVTI. So what I'm saying is there are certain things, the certain promises rather, which have to be expressed very explicitly and they must become part of the communication, not leaving anything to customers' imagination and judgment. It has to be the brand managers and marketing managers that have to make sure that any promises that will bring the brand certain benefits in terms of pushing it upwards, the value pyramid have to be talked about very explicitly. Now, let us talk about the negative promises. I said we should not talk about the negative promises, but then there are situations where brands do carry negative promises. Having said that, it doesn't mean that we incorporate as part of the brand contract that certain things are negative and therefore they form the negative part of the contract. It is not that. Negative promises do crop up during so many different situations. You, you're trying to deliver all the positive promises in the hope that they are going to bring you a higher level of sales, not only associations, because when we talk of associations and different levels, and emotional values and so on and so forth, we are basically talking about increasing sales. That's what the whole thing boils down to. So situations where negative promises crop up could be explained with the help of a couple of examples. To give you an example from the auto industry, let us assume that a company is talking about the 3S and it is very proud of the fact that it is offering 3S service, meaning sales, service, meaning after sales, and spares. And of course, when company talks about spares, I mean the third S, it is talking about free availability, and maybe also at a price which is very customer friendly. Think about the same company falling short on that promise. 
not being able to provide you with the kind of service which you expect. This is where I'm talking about customers' expectations also. And this is one of the questions in so many different the marketing research models, whether it is the image or development of the brand contract or something else which we're going to discuss and talk about later in the forthcoming lectures. Anyway, getting back to the 3S company falling short on the promise, what's going to happen? It's not in a position to provide you with the right kind of service. Well, I shouldn't say right kind of service. Maybe the company is providing you with the right kind of service, but maybe the problem is of accessibility. The service centers which the company has are too few. And you have to log a long distance to get there and then queues and then waiting in hours and hours. What's going to happen? It's going to put you off. Maybe you are a loyal customer or a friendly customer, you know, who has you know, bought the brand, but you may start talking negatively about the service, the level of service they're providing to their customers. And the word of mouth carries very heavyweight kind of uh, repercussions. Anyone hearing that may start considering another model about which he or she perceives that that model offers a better service. And perception is stronger than reality. It is very proverbial in the world of marketing. And perception being stronger than reality, that potential customer of brand A of your car is going to go to somebody else and buy brand B. So this is one of the repercussions. The company does not even know that it has lost one of its potential customers. The problem may also, when I say a problem, what I mean is a negative promise. A negative promise may also crop up in the area of spares. It's a very important area. What if the spare parts are not available? Or even if they are, they are available at prices higher or beyond the range which the customer perceives. It again is a question of perception. So the repercussions of uh, the falling short on the promise, which is a very significant promise in terms of the car industry, or for that matter, motorbike industry, carries the kind of implications which you as brand managers would like to avoid. And you must, because you want to uphold the contract. Let me give you another example to make the concept even more clear. Let us talk about a cellular phone company talking about a new campaign offering low rates at a certain time of the day or night and motivating you or rather prompting you into using your telephone more and more because what they are selling is time. They're selling time. So they want you to use that time more and more. They have offered discount rates at a certain time of the day. And they also say very explicitly that you will enjoy using this service. Even if they do not talk about that, the overall advertising campaign might very implicitly carry this promise that while using this service, you're going to be very comfortable. Take it for granted. Rest assured. So what's going to happen if the company falls short on the promise? Why? Because the company may not be in a position to cope with the growing demand which has stemmed from the promotion they have offered. The result is people cannot even talk with each other. At least they were talking comfortably before at a higher price they were paying, but now they are getting frustrated and they're desperate. They're talking with other companies into getting new connections and the process goes on, meaning bad promises playing their part and dissuading or putting off their existing customers and also potential customers. 
with the help of these examples, I think it should become very clear the significance of uh, being able to deliver your promises, meaning all the positive promises. In anything which you think may go wrong, it will, as they say, as a proverb. And um, you've got to be very sensitive. That is the crux of the matter. You've got to stay very sensitive to that kind of a possibility, to that kind of an eventuality, and at any cost, must try to avoid that. However, if you have gotten into that kind of a situation, then as a good company or as part of good management, you must try to fix that. Fixing the problem is the name of the game in that kind of situation. You have to uphold the contract. You know that. Now, about fixing the negative promise, let me add one point here, which might sound kind of diverging from the main topic, but I think it is very important to talk about. It does have relevance here. Strong brands, meaning which are very valuable and powerful, they have a lot of flexibility and resilience to bounce back if negative promises are fixed. It is because of that reason that companies try so very hard to hit the pinnacle of the value pyramid. Because when they are there, the emotional connection that's been established between the brand and the customer binds the two for a long time because the brand contract is created, it is established, and it becomes very difficult for competitors to dislodge you if you occupy that position. Now, I'm talking about a hypothetical situation where your brand, which is at the pinnacle, has run into a certain problem and it has started offering negative promise or promises, and you are there to fix the situation. The situation might, has, might have arisen in the operations area, in the distribution area, or before that, logistics area, marketing support services area. Whatever it is, the problem has to be identified to be fixed. I was talking about the resilience or the flexibility that strong brands have to bounce back. The association is so strong that even if you have gotten into that kind of a tough and difficult situation, your customers do wait in, in many, many situations. They do wait for you to fix the problem because they have become loyal to the point that they know that the next introduction that you are going to come up with in the market is going to be with improved benefits and with the eradication of the problem that they have been facing, or with the eradication of the negative promise which the product started carrying. There could be so many examples, and together without naming uh, the brands, uh, there are examples in the auto industries that uh, a, a car model ran into certain problems, and um, people uh, were kind of uh, the very uh, surprised and they were disappointed that this company which has had such a tremendous reputation in terms of quality and upholding uh, their contract. While consumers do not talk in that terminology that the company is upholding the contract or not, this is I talking with you with who are all professionals in the making. So customers start talking about in these terms that the company which has had such a tremendous reputation has run, run into uh, this kind of a problem, and uh, this could be one of those odd cases, uh, and uh, uh, we are sure that the company will bounce back and uh, they will come up with uh, something uh, which is uh, without this problem. People are so brand loyal, this is debatable, I will talk about this also later, but for the time being, let's assume that some of the customers are so brand loyal that they get into arguments with um, other customers who are their peers, friends, relatives, colleagues, whoever, uh, who are followers of other brands. And they make statements like, uh, very fancy and fascinating statements like, wait until you know, this company comes up with uh, the eradicated model and uh, then you will know why my brand is superior 
to yours. The point is that the brand contract has got to be upheld at any cost. If a company is not in a position to fix the problem immediately, the company must start working on that and must engage all the resources, all the colleagues, all the peers, take into confidence all the stakeholders to let everybody know how the company plans to fix the problem because the contract that has been established has to be fixed. Suppose it is not a situation where you are fixing uh, the problem. You are just wanting to improve. You still have to go through all these phases. You still have to talk with all these uh, people I've talked about and come up with um, a contract which is worth considering on part of the customers. So until the shortcomings are removed, the contract is not complete. Or in other words, the contract is not strong. Why? Because it is going to be validated. It is going to be endorsed by the customers in the market. You and I may say anything about the brand that we have introduced, but people in the market, until the time they say, yeah, we understand this benefit and we know this advantage is very weighty and they love it, until that time we cannot say that the contract created by us internally is endorsed and is approved. Having said that, let us now take a look at uh, a hypothetical brand contract. Let us assume that we are building this contract for people within the company with its ultimate destination in the market. It is destined for the market because it is destined to be translated into benefits, associations, and then for endorsement and validation. This contract is about the same company, XYZ, that decided to come into the market of fast food. Now, there is a subtle nuance or a subtle uh, difference here because I'm talking about a company which is coming into the market and we also keep talking about brands which are established. So whether it is coming into the market or it is established, you will know the way to make changes um, with words when it comes to developing the contract internally first of course. So do not get confused by the fact that this company is stepping into the market trying to have a step in the door with another brand which already exists and being maintained by the brand managers and its respective company. Okay, let's take a look at the screen and uh, we talk about the brand contract point by point. Let us assume that all of us you and I are part of this company and uh, have developed this contract. The company is saying, we promise to offer you, meaning the company is talking with uh, the consumers or the customers. It promises to offer you world-class quality of meat and a compatible level of breads. The company is selling sandwiches. The major ingredients are the meats and the breads. Of course, they also have other condiments, which also take on a lot of significance. But this is a promise which the company is making with its customers, that we are offering you world-class meat and compatible levels of breads, meaning the meats could be imported because they're world-class. Even if they're not imported, they are of very high quality. And if we talk of the meats of being so high quality, we're also talking in the same breath of the breads that we're using and we say they're also good. Don't misunderstand that only meat is a quality product and the bread is not. Promise number one. Now let's go on to next promise. Promise number two. We all know that the meats which are used by fast food companies are frozen meats. 
whether they are procured locally or imported from foreign markets, they have to be maintained at a certain temperature, which is a very low temperature. And even if the customers are not mindful of that, it is the responsibility of the brand managers to let it be known as part of the product makeup or the brand makeup that this is the kind of process which is involved in maintaining the meats which we say are of world quality. So we are telling them or we are communicating with them that the company maintains all the critical control points involved in maintaining the minus 20 degree temperature. So in other words, we're also educating the customers that it is minus 20 degrees Celsius temperature which is required to carry the stuff that we use for the sandwiches. And the customers might have this question flashing into their minds. If it is that way, what if the meats are imported? How do you make sure or how does the company make sure that um, whatever comes their way passes through all the phases about which standards of temperature are fully adhered to. This is the responsibility of the company not to get into all the details or not to get into all the phases or stages which are involved from the point of the supplier right down to the point of consumption. No, what I'm saying is that the company must talk about maintaining certain standards which give the product a certain level of quality. And it is toward that that the company is talking about maintaining the minus 20 degree temperature. So this shows seriousness on part of the company regarding maintenance of quality levels. They are talking of quality temperature which lead to quality product. They're not going to get something which is stale and that's the reason that when you go to these fast food joints, you don't find sandwiches which taste stale or which smell bad. I don't think it ever happens that way. And if it happens that way, that becomes a negative promise. And then you see as a brand manager or as one of the managers of the company, you have to identify what is wrong where. Another promise which the company XYZ has decided to make because they think it carries a lot of weight and it will translate into certain benefits and therefore it is very important for the customers to know what we have to offer. The company says all other condiments, meaning all other ingredients which go as part of the eatable things, have been selected with the sophistication of a world-class chef for your eating pleasure, the company is making a statement. The company is telling its customers that we're going to see to it that you are pleased with the experience of eating. And the technical expertise that we employ toward creating all this is from a person who is like an international chef. Okay. Another promise which company XYZ has decided to make, the company says, our area of operation, meaning the kitchen, wherever this company is, is so neat that if you were to see that, you would like to overindulge into eating and come back to us over and over again. This might sound like an overstatement. You might start arguing or if you might start questioning the ability of the company to be able to do all that. It is creating kind of a challenge for the customers that something they have, the process they have at work, which they are very proud to have maintained with full cleanliness is so world class and is so good that any one of you 
if he had seen that, would come back to the company and buy sandwich over and over again. So the significance of this promise is that the company must carry this promise and the company must do all that it takes to maintain what the company is promising. It must be very clean in terms of its operations because there could be a strong possibility someone calling you and requesting you to walk into your kitchen just to see or just to reassure that whatever you are claiming is right. Now you might start questioning, is it that we publicize this contract? Wait until I am done with the contract and then I will start talking about that point as well. Another uh, promise which uh, the company might make is we undertake to deliver the order within 30 minutes. This is a very strong commitment. Now the company is talking about part of the company's vision when it envisioned the product in this category and thought to itself that delivering sandwiches directly to customers right at their doorstep is not a bad idea because it is going to provide customers with a new experience. It is going to revolutionize the service. Not that nobody else is doing this kind of business, not that nobody else is offering this kind of service. It is that the sum of all the variables, that sum of all the promises that your brand carries is going to be so attractive for the customer that when you provide the customer with your sandwich within 30 minutes, it is going to revolutionize the service. The implication here again is does the company have the operational ability to do that? Has it really trained its people to be that quick and that efficient? Has it taken into account the extraneous factors, meaning the traffic jams, and so on and so forth? It boils down to the area of operational efficiencies. Can the company achieve all that? Well, if the company can, the promise is delivered. And if this kind of a promise is delivered, along with the ones I've talked about earlier, then I think the company is on its way to developing very strong associations with its customers and going to give the competition a hard time. But then, it is through this process of delivering promises that negative promises crop up. Like I told you earlier, negative promises are not something which you deliberately incorporate as part of the contract. They crop up because of certain inabilities, because of certain basic competencies going wrong, going, going, going stray, you know, here and there. Not leaving the company total room for being able to deliver all the company ambitions to deliver. Not only a sandwich in 30 minutes, meaning all the promises. The next promise the company is making with uh, its customers is our staff, the company is saying, our staff is efficient, skillful, and courteous who deliver on time with a smile. What if that is not the case? Not everybody is courteous, but then it is the objective of the company to make sure that staff members who are part of the delivery team really are very courteous and also those who are entertaining orders or the ordering system. And those who deliver, they must deliver with a smile on their face, even if they've had an accident on their way. This also is part of service marketing. And I think we shall recall that talking about company XYZ or brand XYZ, we are talking about two different parts are two very important pillars of the area of marketing, meaning product marketing and also service marketing. This is a very interesting case, this hypothetical case that I'm talking with you uh, for the last so many lectures, because it takes into account not only the product, meaning the tangible product, but also the intangible part, which is provision of service.
and hence service marketing. So the company has got to make sure that service marketing part is well taken care of. And to be able to do that, they have to do some internal marketing. And internal marketing is all about training, it's all about motivating people, it's all about educating them about the significance of being courteous. Delivery under such circumstances either makes the brand or breaks the brand. That's the one tough thing about service marketing. Like a tangible product, it cannot have a very uniform level of quality. You and I are buying a package, a package of biscuits for example, and we know it's, it's of very high quality. One pack that we buy today is like the one that we bought yesterday, for example. So the tangible products, which are a result of an assembly line process, are very different from those products which are delivered as a service because humans are involved. And humans, being the most complex thing on this planet, are difficult to understand. They behave difficult in a difficult way at many occasions. So it is the one of the prime objectives of uh, the brand management team to take it up with their counterparts on the operations side who really can train their people in a way that courtesy becomes the hallmark of the company. Now, I said it is here that brand managers must take up the matter with their counterparts on the operations side. I'm talking about the touch points. I'm talking about the interfaces that brand management has with other functions. And I think it goes without saying that all functions within a company are interfaced. They all have touch points or contact points where they touch each other. And it is at those boundaries or it is at those borders that we have to see that the transition or going across the functional lines is smooth and without any disturbances. Otherwise, those will cause distortions of brand character. Further explaining of this concept, what if the brand manager is crying his head out? For God's sake, do something about the service which is not good and our brand is getting a tarnished image and the person on the operation side not being able to fix the problem. It will lead to a tussle which can go on and if it goes on for a long time or for a longer time, implications can be well imagined. Another promise which the company might make with its customers is we claim to have revolutionized the lunch service by offering a unique product that couples efficient service and hence offer you a unique experience. Now, this is a promise which uh, takes into its fold all the points that I already have talked about. So you can look upon this as kind of a summary of all the points or the implications that I've talked about in relation to all the points while taking a look at this promise. Another promise that the company might make or rather the company is making because it's part of the contract uh, with its customers is the value for money that we offer is second to none. Now here the company is making a claim. It's a tall claim. But then you know that the strategy which emanated from segmentation and differentiation very well supports this claim. You started with uh, a segment and you started with a price quality index. If you recall that uh, uh, illustration, you started with uh, the premise that the price is going to be very consumer friendly. It is going to be competitive. Whereas the quality of the sandwich is going to be at the highest level, which is the benchmark of the market at the moment. 
Now, if the company is in a position to do all that, meaning is in a position to deliver all those promises, then I would say the company is doing a wonderful job. And I would say the company is well on its way to achieving a good level of or a decent level of market share by attracting customers who are going to talk about the, the brand in positive terms and by word of mouth, the word is going to spread and so on and so forth. Having talked about the promises which form the contract or rather which have formed the brand contract of brand XYZ in the fast food area, we now must understand what are the principles or what are the fundamentals that should be at work in order to develop this kind of a contract? Well, the principles are pretty straightforward. Principle number one is that you've got to look at the promises from the customer's perspective. And this is something which I keep talking about, whether I'm talking uh, about uh, the image building or I'm talking about uh, the, the brand contract or I'm talking about uh, things which precede the development of image and all that, it is the perspective of the customer that we must never lose sight of. We must understand the expectations that the customer has because we are entering the market and we are going to win our customers who have been used to our uh, competitors' products and we would like them to switch to our brand. Whether those customers are going to come from segment five, which is the top segment of the market at the moment, going back to the illustration, or that they're going to come to our brand from segment three, or maybe segment two, because they think the value for money this brand offers is absolutely exceptional, because the price they're offering uh, is like um, very low. Uh, in relation to the quality, it should have been like uh, maybe you know 150, you know, whereas they are selling at rupees 80 only. So when the consumers start talking so positively about a brand, you can well imagine the level of validation and endorsement your brand is generating in the marketplace. So this is what you have to understand from consumers' perspective meaning what are the expectations and what is it that he or she is expecting from the competition and what is it that they will expect from your brand if they decide to switch over. All the attributes and all the features that you have built into the product have got to be fully related with the characteristics of the segment you're going to operate in. And uh, it goes without saying, when you started uh, by having that illustration with which uh, described all the price quality indexes, you were quite very clear about the market segment you were going to operate in. And getting to the point of uh, the developing the, your brand contract, the, you are now very well aware of the first fundamental principle which is at work. Understand the consumer's perspective. Without that, nothing will move. This is something you know, one can talk volumes, but I think we are quite very clear by now what consumers' perspective is in relation to development of brands. And we shall keep talking about this in relation to all the concepts that we discuss one by one. And don't lose the perspective. We cannot, I will repeat, we cannot talk about all these concepts out of a separate box. These are all related. They're all intertwined like this. And they've got to be talked in relation to each other. And therefore, wherever I think I can develop a touch point uh, in relation to some other concept within the ambit of uh, brand management, I will always talk about that and relate the two for your benefit and better understanding. Okay, having talked about uh, the first principle, let us now look at the implications which this principle may have uh, for the brand contract that we just discussed, meaning brand XYZ. 
You would like to talk with uh, your customers asking questions like, uh, what are the expectations uh, that you had from our brand? And does our brand fulfill your expectations? So what are the kind of expectations that you have from uh, the competition? And you name uh, competitive brands. Uh, you think uh, that our expect you think that the benefits our brand provided you with uh, exceed uh, the ones you get from um, those of uh, the competition. So these are the kind of questions that you ask your customers. Uh, you can also ask them uh, things like, uh, "What is their um, thinking about uh, the filling of the sandwich?" Because that's the uh, the major part of uh, the product. It is just like uh, they're talking about uh, the engine performance of, uh, of a car model, of a model of uh, the motorbike. Um, similarly, you talk about um, the sandwiches, about their fillings. So you may like to be very, uh, very direct and very uh, straightforward in asking them about their uh, the feelings and about their experience with uh, the size of the filling that you have and uh, the taste uh, profile of your sandwich in comparison with uh, the, the competition. And in particular, you must ask them a question uh, which really can, the answer to which can testify that your product is well positioned, meaning it is different from the rest of the crowd because that was one of the premises when you started your uh, development of the brand. Uh, you said it is going to be uh, it is going to have a health appeal, meaning it is going to be different. Now, when you say that, or when the company says that, maybe what the company means is it is not going to have any fried items, for example, which lead to you know, high cholesterol levels and so on and so forth. So when you say the you know, health sandwiches, so naturally you've got to do something about that. And if you have done that, and the promise is the well delivered and the well taken at the consumer end, you must ask this question so that you can reassure yourself about uh, the delivery of the promise. If it is delivered, it is validated. If it is not, you have a problem. Better fix that. Another um, question that might come to your mind uh, in relation to this uh, principle number one, meaning never lose perspective of the consumer, uh, could be what are the further improvements which you think we can bring about uh, in our brand. Now, there might be certain respondents who get uh, kind of disturbed and uh, feel put off uh, by uh, having asked questions leading to lengthy answers. And that is why I suggested you have a multiple answer listing ready so that those who are short of time can answer your question, but also keeping one open-ended choice to yourself and to them because you never know a customer might come up or a respondent might come up with a very fancy, picturesque, and um, fascinating kind of a quote that might lead to uh, future developments. You never know that. Or it might be so fanciful and so fascinating that it cannot be translated into reality. So that's upon you to see what is it that you really can do. A few more questions you know, that you can ask yourselves is uh, what are the kind of real differences that you feel you know, our brand has in comparison with the competition? And uh, what is it that we can do in order to improve our service? And so on and so forth. And I think in having talked about all these questions, which you can relate to the fundamental principle number one, I leave the rest to your imagination. I have set your juices flowing, and you will know a few more questions that you must ask uh, yourselves and uh, the answers which you must get uh, before proceeding with the uh, development of uh, the brand contract. The crux of the matter is that anything that you do in relation to the brand contract, meaning in relation to its development, has got to be customer driven because it's got to be validated outside. The crux of the whole discussion is that your effort toward development of the brand contract has got to be customer driven because 
it is going to be validated in the marketplace. And having said so, you must take into account the opinions of all the influencers. They're not only your customers, I mean your ultimate customers, they're also members of the trade who influence the brand contract. We shall discuss about that and how they do that. But it is very important to take into account opinions of all those who really matter and be ready to face a few negative promises as well and then be ready to fix those. I shall continue my lecture with this discussion in the next lecture. Until then, Allah Hafiz.